All right, 7 p.m., Friday night, it's time to learn some Bible. And tonight, Lord willing, we'll get into the book of Acts and some other books in the New Testament, and we'll dig into Genesis. Before we get started, why don't we have a little review of some things we have learned. So, we're in the class Old Testament and New Testament survey, and... We've learned a few things about the Bible. One of them is how many books are in the Bible. Everybody, how many books are in the Bible? 66. How many are in the Old Testament? 39. 39, good. It's 13 times 3. In the New Testament, how many books are there? 27. 9 times 3. Yep, 39 and 27. If you're a Mormon, you got the Book of Mormon in addition to that. How many? No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I'm still working on some missionaries right now. Um, Mormons get really old because they don't want to listen. They want to talk, 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 and they don't want to give an ear at all. The moment you start bringing up Bible verses, they want to say, no, 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 look at this one in the Book of Mormon. So it gets frustrating. Who could tell me something you've learned? We'll have one person. Something you've learned about the Book of Genesis. Anything about the Book of Genesis. Like three-eggs and ham and earth. Hey. There you go. If you didn't know it before, now you know. That's right. God created the heaven and the earth. How about the book of Joshua? Somebody else. Crossing into the promised land. Crossing into the promised land. East to west. They cut across the Jordan Sea and came into Canaan. How about somebody tell me something you remember? Mm -hmm. This will be a tough. Out of the book of Nehemiah. What do you they were rebuilding the wall. There we go. They were rebuilding the wall. That's right. And how about something from Isaiah? I'll go 66 chapters. Yeah, it's a mini Bible. There we go. 66 chapters. And it's divided into two sections, 39 chapters and then 27 chapters, just like our Bible. And a lot of modern theologians and that's just a fancy word for people who pervert the bible a lot of modern theologians like to say that isaiah only wrote the first 39 but i just learned this week i already knew that isaiah wrote the whole thing but i saw something that god gave me this week when paul is quoting isaiah chapter 65 he said have you not read what isaiah wrote so obviously isaiah wrote it paul said it that settles it and that's isaiah how about something from the book of hosea isaiah's cousin he's not really Hosea, the first minor prophet. Hmm. There we go. His wife was Gomer, and she was a bad lady, but God told him to marry her anyway. That's good. That's a picture of the Lord's relationship with Israel. And last, but not least, who can tell me anything you remember from the book of Matthew? There we go. John the Baptist came in six months before Jesus Christ he was born. Good. Okay, so we remember some things. It's not all just gone, you know, in one ear out the other. I know it's hard. A lot of times when it doesn't matter how good or how spiritual or how anything a teacher or a preacher is, if you hear a lot of teaching and preaching, it's easy to forget a lot of what you've been taught. That's why Paul says, I will not fail to put you in remembrance of these things. He's always got to remind and remind and remind. He told Timothy... I will that these things thou affirm constantly. It means just over and over and over. You've got to review and review because it's very easy to forget. Okay, let's ask for God's help and let's dig in to the book of Acts. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I pray that you'll help us tonight to believe what you have to say. And I pray that your spirit will be in control, will teach us and guide us. God, I pray that we'll yield to the spirit even if we've had an awful, carnal, wicked day. Help us right now to confess our sin, to forsake it. Choose to walk in the Spirit for the next two hours and to listen to what you have to say so that you can teach us, God. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. The book of Acts. We are finished with the Gospels. And now, Acts. Uh, it's titled the Acts of the Apostles, which is, you know, partially true. It's, it's a history of what the Apostles did. Other people call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of the history of the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven and dealing with the early church. And we're going to look through a lot of the book of Acts tonight. It's an important, important book. 
And if you remember, there are three books in the New Testament that are not for the church that will get you twisted up if you take all the doctrine out of them. Does anybody remember what those three are? What's the first one? Matthew. Matthew. And Matthew is a transition from Old Testament to New Testament. Or uh, let's say Old Testament to Christ. And then the next one is going to be? Luke. No? Nope. Acts. Acts is a transition from Christ, or the Gospels, Christ, and it transitions to the church. And that takes place uh, with Paul. The third transition book, where you're transitioning a dispensation, is going to be? Not John. Hebrews. Good, I heard it. Hebrews. So Matthew transitions, Acts transitions, and Hebrews transitions. Hebrews is from church to, I'll just say trib, to the tribulation. So there's a lot of doctrine in Matthew that the church just can't use. It's not for us. There's a lot of doctrine in Acts that we're going to see tonight that the church is not supposed to take for itself. It's written for our learning, but it is not doctrine for the church. There is some in there, but not a lot. And the book of Hebrews is a transition away from the church and back to the Jews in the tribulation. So you got to be careful about taking doctrinal verses out of Hebrews and trying to make them apply to the church. Tonight, let's look at some of the things out of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse number 1. Let's see who the author is. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Does anybody remember that Theophilus that we talked about? Who remembers what book we talked about Theophilus in? Luke. Luke. In Luke chapter 1, he said, um, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke wrote the book of Luke, and Luke wrote the book of Acts. He wrote a lot, an awful lot. And he says in verse 2, well, Verse 1, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So that's the book of Luke. Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, something, or a couple things that are important to note right there. First, the commandments that Jesus gave right then, right before he ascended, were to who? According to that verse. The apostles. Commandments unto the apostles. A lot of times, preachers and teachers like to take Jesus' commandments right there when he was on the Mount of Olives and about to go up, and they like to take those and apply them to the church. And some of it definitely does apply indirectly, but it is not directly to the church. Because when Jesus told them to go and preach the gospel right then, he told them that when people believe, signs will follow. He told them if somebody gets saved, like in Mark 16, if they get saved, then they believe, then they will speak in tongues, they'll be able to get a serpent's bite, an adder's bite, you know, a poisonous snake can bite them and they won't be harmed, they can drink poison and they won't be harmed. And you can't take that doctrine for the church, it's not for the church age, it's for the age of the apostles, which we're about to learn about in the book of Acts. There are people in West Virginia, when I was like 18 years old, it was in the news that a church just down the street from us had to send somebody to the emergency room because they had snake handling. They took doctrine out of this passage, out of, uh, I think it's Mark 16, and they tried to say, hey, if you really get saved, then you can let a copperhead bite you in the arm and you'll be totally fine. No, that's stupid. It's not true. And, you know, at that time, it was absolutely true, and it even happened to Paul. But it's not true for us. And wrongly dividing preachers got somebody sent to the ER and maybe they died for all I know. You know? Don't take wrong doctrine out of these books. That's the, the bottom line here. So it's written unto the apostles. Verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So, hey, if this is written to you and me, why are you and I in Robins instead of Jerusalem? Jesus said, don't depart from Jerusalem. You know, you can't, this was specific doctrine for the apostles at that exact time. But wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. So they're waiting for something. He told them to wait for the promise from the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. This is very, very clear, and the, the scripture is just so plain on this, but a lot of Charismatics and Pentecostals get it very wrong. So, you need to understand, out of verse 4, he said he wanted them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for this, the promise from uh, the promise of the Father. I want you guys to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. You say, what in the world is that? Well, he tells you in verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be, right here, baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not baptism by water. This is different. This is not dipping somebody down in the water. This is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus Christ calls that the promise of the Father. And he tells them when it's going to happen. Does anybody see when it's going to happen in verse 5? Not many days in it. Right there. Not many days hence. Oh my goodness. If only, if only, if only people could read the Bible, a whole lot of charismatics would be stopped from uh, sending people to hell. Not many days hence. So, let's do some math. Jesus had died, and that was on, does anybody remember the feast day that he died on that week? What was the big feast that week? The Jewish holiday. Passover. The Passover. Jesus Christ was our Passover lamb, and he died on the Passover. So Christ died, and then on the Passover, I'll put Passover right here, and then for how many days did he show himself to the apostles? We just read it. Forty. Forty days. So there's the Passover, and there's forty days. And right here, at the end of forty days, he says, quote, the promise of the Father is going to come not many days hence. So, it's going to be not many days after that 40 days. Charismatics say that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is still happening to people today. No, it's been many days since then. He said it's going to come not many days hence. All right? So... Let's try to figure out what that is. What is this baptism of the Holy Ghost? Because it's important. It's one of the things that Jesus warned them about and told them was coming here. In verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? We've talked about that before. They were asking, is it time for the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom? What does he say? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the apostles' job, once Jesus Christ left, was not to go back and fish. Their job for the rest of their lives was to be witnesses of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Witnesses of him. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, 
shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. A couple things you need to know from that passage. One, when Jesus rises, that's a picture of you and me being translated. And we're going to rise the same way. He went up into a what? Wow. A cloud wow. received him out of their sight. Paul tells us that we shall meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to be uh, we're going to join the dead in Christ in the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. Very similar. Um, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 mm -hmm. that we are going to be caught up. And in Revelation, it, talking about Jesus right here, it says that he was caught up. So caught up, just like you and me, Jesus was being a picture of you and me right here, of how we're going to be translated out of here if the Lord uh, doesn't tarry. And one more thing to think about is that the angels that talked to the apostles right there said, in like manner, the same way he went up is the same way he's going to come down. So when he comes back at the second coming, where do you think he's going to land? Same spot he went up. Where were they right here? Anybody notice? Was it in this passage? It might be in uh, some of the other passages there. But you can see it in, I think it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's talking to them from the Mount of Olives. And he gets taken up from the Mount of Olives. And these two angels said, when he comes back, he'll come in like manner. And guess where his two feet land when he comes down at the second coming? The Mount of Olives. That's in Zechariah <coughs> chapter 14, if you want to go look it up where his feet come down, and when his feet land, an earthquake happens and changes the whole geography of the, the place. But that's for another night. So, to stay focused on what we're talking about here, we're trying to find out what is this baptism of the Holy Ghost? What is the promise? That baptism of the Holy Ghost, what is he talking about? And the apostles had the same question. They weren't sure. That's why they asked him, wilt thou now restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, is that what you're talking about? Because they didn't know what he meant. Well, all, he, all they knew was it's going to come not many days hence. So there's that. In the end of chapter 1, there is kind of a meeting together with Peter and the apostles, and they pick out one guy to replace Judas. And then in chapter 2, here's what we're going to try to learn the answer here in chapter 2. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Whoa. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. If you know anything about the Bible, you know the wind pictures the Holy Spirit of God an awful lot of times. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. So cloven is like a, 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 cat, a cow's foot cloven split in two cloven tongues so tongues that were split in two and they were on fire and it sat upon each of them i've never had that happen to me it would be a very strange thing verse four and there and they were all filled with the holy ghost does that sound familiar they were filled with the holy ghost and what happened and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were, dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So there were people, it even says down here, it lists off all kinds of nations in verse 9 and 10 and 11. All these different people who spoke all different languages had come together to Jerusalem to worship the Lord at this feast. What was the feast called in verse 1? Pentecost. Good. In the Old Testament, that feast, Pentecost, is called the Feast of Weeks. W-E-A-K-S. Feast of Weeks. I'm sorry, W-E-E-K-S. It's called the Feast of Weeks because God commanded in the law with, with uh, Moses, after you serve the Passover, after you observe the Passover, I want you to wait seven Sabbaths. So how many days is seven Sabbaths? 49. 49 days. He said after the seventh Sabbath on the next day. So what's 49 plus 1? 50. 50. And what is the word penti? You know, if you see the word penti, it usually means five. Pent is five. So Pentecost 
is talking about the 50th day after the Passover, the Feast of Weeks. And people were gathered together into Jerusalem to obey the law and observe the Feast of Weeks, or what the passage here calls Pentecost. So if you've never understood what that word Pentecost comes from, that's it right there. It's just 50 days. I'll do right here. 40 days there, and then 50 days there. So if you know math, here Jesus ascended. How many days from when Jesus ascended until the Pentecost? Ten. Ten days. What did Jesus say right here? Not many days hence. Ten is not many. Right now, it's been like a million days since uh, Jesus ascended, right? It's been 2,000 years worth of days. He said, not many days hence, you're going to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. What was he talking about? Well, obviously right here, the Holy Ghost came down and filled all these apostles, and they started preaching, and they were speaking in un not unknown tongues, it says in other tongues. That means if there was somebody here from Italy, and somebody from China, and somebody from... Taiwan, somebody from Australia, they could all understand in their own tongue what was being preached, which is a miracle. That's not something that normally happens. That's outside of the laws of nature. And that was given, that was a gift given to those apostles by the Holy Ghost. And something you'll see all throughout the book of Acts is that the Holy Ghost comes on men and then they'll do something as a result of the Holy Ghost coming on them. So the Holy Ghost came on them here, and they started speaking with other tongues. And that was, uh, that's all it says right there. So they preached. And it doesn't say they spoke in unknown tongues. You know, the silly nonsense that Pentecostals do. <laughs> they were speaking with actual other languages. They might not have known the languages, but the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. It was a miracle. It was very, very cool what the Holy Spirit did right there. You'll see all throughout the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes on someone, there are two things that always, always, always accompany people when the Holy Spirit comes on them. Every time. And it's not speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues happens sometimes. Other times, it says they were slain in the Spirit. I don't know what that looks like. I guess they passed out or something like that. I'm not sure. Maybe they all just got knocked over. That was something that would accompany sometimes. But here is what happened Every time, and you can look it up, look up all the times in Acts when the Holy Ghost comes on people, two things always happen. One, they spake the word of God. Every single time that the Holy Ghost came on someone, the word of God started coming out of their mouth. And you can check that. Two, while they spake the word of God, they did it with this right here. Boldness. Now, tongues came and went, and being slain in the Spirit came and went. But these two always, always happened because these two accompany anyone filled with the Holy Spirit. You speak the Word of God, and you do it with boldness. That means when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, because of who He is and because of the power of the Word of God, if you're witnessing to somebody, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you shouldn't be... Well, you know, I, I, I know you believe different, and I, 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 I don't believe like you believe, and, and that's okay. You can have your beliefs. No, that's, that's sissy nonsense. You need to be speaking the word of God with boldness. Hey, listen. For example, Mormon missionary, you are preaching a false, accursed gospel, and you need to repent and quit it because you are going to send people to hell. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Quit trusting in your own works. You need to do things with boldness when you are preaching. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that'll come naturally. So, 50 days after Christ's death, we have this Pentecost. And that's the Holy Ghost coming down on these men. If you take a quick glance over in Acts 11, Peter is going to have himself a little realization. If you remember... At the beginning here, the promise of the Father was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he said, it's going to come not many days hence. And how many days was it? Ten, Ten days. Jesus told the truth. Now, Peter, they, I guess they hadn't really talked about what happened at Pentecost. And here in Acts chapter 11 and verse 15, he says this. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Talking about Pentecost. Then remembered I 
the word of the Lord, how that he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So in chapter, uh, in verse 16, he says, I'm sorry, verse 15, he says, At the beginning, talking about Pentecost, the beginning of the Holy Ghost's work there in the book of Acts, he says, At the beginning, then remembered I what Jesus said to us, you shall be baptized. So Peter is making it very clear. What Jesus was talking about when he told them the baptism of the Holy Ghost would come was Pentecost. That event, that one day when the Holy Ghost came on to the apostles and gave them other tongues. Now, the reason that's important is because Pentecostals and Charismatics will take that phrase, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and tell you that when you get saved, the Holy Ghost doesn't come on you right away. But sometime after you're saved, then you'll receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Is that true? No. When do you get the Holy Ghost? The moment you get saved. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. If any man have, this, have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You're not in Jesus Christ if you don't have his Spirit. They go hand in hand. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. There is a baptism of the Holy Ghost for you and me, but it's not like this one. It's different. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the Spirit of God and that's the body of Jesus Christ. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So right here it says, by one spirit are we most baptized? Are only the ones who have been saved a while baptized? No, all, everybody who believed. From the moment they believed, every single Christian is baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ's body. That is the baptism of the Spirit today in the church. This is something different. It was a one-time event that happened at Pentecost, and Charismatics use that to teach a false doctrine that convinces people that they can go to hell after they're saved. It's not true. The book of Acts can confuse you and trip you up if you don't study it. This is one of those things. Very important to understand. So, turn with me now to Acts chapter 13. We're moving on from that concept. I hope you've got it. Any questions about the baptism of the Holy Ghost there? What happened at Pentecost? Multitudes were saved was the result. And it said, you know, thousands were added to the church. And every single day, many were added, uh, such as should be saved. Now chapter 13 and verse 39 in the book of Acts. It says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. 39. And by him, by Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Amen. That's a helpful verse. Right Amen. There. In the law of Moses, you could not be justified. You could have temporary forgiveness of sins, but you could not have your whole slate wiped clean. We talked about that last time. But by him, by Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from all all things. Thank the Lord for that. That's a blessing. And that's a verse that really shows you the transition. How that in the book of Acts, we're not talking about the law. And we're not talking about Jesus Christ's commandments that he preached on earth anymore. We're changing. We're shifting now. And we're in Acts chapter 13. In Acts 9, Paul got saved. And in Acts 13, he's preaching. So we're transitioning now closer and closer to the church. And Paul's teaching doctrine that applies directly to the church. If you can see the transition happening there. Um, we'll look at a couple more verses and then we'll get an outline of the book of Acts. Chapter 15, verse 7. Chapter 15, verse 7. Here, all the apostles and Paul and Barnabas have met together in Jerusalem to talk about this question. Can Gentiles really get saved? And in Acts chapter 15, verse 7, here's the answer. 
And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Good. So God used Peter to preach to some of the first Gentiles. Verse 8. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Why are you telling... Just like we've been learning about in the book of Galatians, why are you telling the Gentiles that they have to keep the law? They don't. We weren't able to bear that, and neither are you, and neither can they. Verse 11. Here's what Peter believed in Acts chapter 15. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Does that ring a bell? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are ye saved. We believe that through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. That is Peter in Acts chapter 15. But in Acts chapter 2, and I'll look at verse 38, that's not what Peter preaches. Peter says something different. In Acts chapter 2, he says, not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and not through the grace of God. It's In Acts chapter 2, 38, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's Peter just 13 chapters apart preaching two totally different types of Gospels. Does that show you the transition that's happening here? This is why so many people get tripped up on books like Acts, because it says two different things in the same book. And you've got to be careful to compare, is what's being said right here the same thing that Paul teaches me in his epistles? That's how you compare and uh, determine whether it's for you. Acts chapter 15, verse 18. He says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So, we're not going to put any heavy burdens on the Gentiles who get saved. We're not going to make them keep the laws and our Jewish customs. Verse 20, But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. So they wrote a letter to all the Gentiles around Judea and gave them some rules. They said, hey, you dirty dog Gentiles, we love you. We're glad you're in the body now, but we've got some rules for you. One, you cannot mess around with things polluted of idols. You can't do idol worship. Two, you cannot fornicate. Obviously, Gentiles had a trouble with idolatry and they had trouble with fornication. What else did they have trouble with? Things strangled. So don't eat things that have been strangled. To be honest, I don't really know why that's super important, but I guess it was to them. Four, from blood. And that's the, there's a commandment to stay away from blood to Noah. That's before the law. There's a commandment in the law to stay away from eating blood. And after the law, there's a commandment to stay away from eating blood. Blood is sacred to God. Blood is the life of the flesh, and we shouldn't go around, you know, drinking blood out of an animal. And... Those are the rules that Peter and the apostles wrote to the Gentiles. So, again... Or every Sunday morning. Sorry? Or every Sunday morning. There we go. Or every Sunday morning when a Catholic thinks that he's drinking Christ's blood, he's yeah. disobeying. Right. Which is gross. We're going to talk some about Catholics tonight. Mm. Chapter 20, verse 17. Chapter 20, verse 17. <clears throat> this is Paul... Towards the end of his final missionary journey, if you know the book of Acts, you know he took three journeys. We'll talk about that in a minute. And right here in, uh, he's calling out the, the elders from Ephesus. So, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So there were multiple elders at the church of Ephesus. He couldn't go to them, so he had them come to where he was in Miletus. And he wants to give them a farewell message. And here's Paul's farewell message. This right here, I call it Paul's epistle in Acts. It's really, really cool. In Acts chapter 20, where he gives Pauline church doctrine to the elders of Ephesus. And it's some good instruction for us that's not in those 13 epistles. So, verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know... 
from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Notice that right there. Just, just pay attention to Paul's heart. What Paul is our example. He's the one we're supposed to, to follow as he follows Christ. He didn't hold back anything profitable. So as a minister, as a Christian, as a father, as a mother, you should not hold back anything profitable to those under you. If, if, if there's a single thing that you can do to help a Christian, you should give it to them. I mean, that quick, selflessly, with the best heart that you can. That was Paul's example. We're not selfish with the things that we learn from the Bible. You're not selfish with the truth. You're not selfish with your money. You're not selfish with your time. You give it, and you give it liberally. I held back nothing that was profitable unto you. Kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. What is he testifying? Repentance toward God. That's not repenting of all your sins. That's turning toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That should, that should be a minister's dream when he's finished with his ministry, that he didn't shun to declare all the counsel of God. Verse 28, here is what the elders of the church are commanded to do. Take Heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Whose blood? God's blood. God's blood. That means Jesus Christ is God. Clear as day. And elders are to be overseers and feed the church. Verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. And he goes on and, and kind of closes out that conversation with them, which is a blessing. But you can see Paul's heart. He was just utterly, with all the people he came into contact with, he gave all of himself to them. He did not hold back one thing. He gave them his whole heart, his mind, his time, his prayer. He even said, I taught you night and day. In 1 Thessalonians, he says, laboring, uh, we rot night and day. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm working really hard, but at the end of the day, I always quit working, and at night, I usually study and sleep. Paul didn't quit working when that sun came down. He kept on going. He worked and worked and worked and worked, and when the sun came down, he worked some more, and when the sun came up, he was working some more. I mean, he worked. He gave himself to these people, and that's our example. And we should really, really have a good work ethic when it comes to ministering and studying the Word of God. <clears throat> Lastly, Acts chapter 24, 14, one of my favorite verses in the Bible that was a real comfort to me in my affliction. Acts chapter 24, verse 14. Paul says, <laughs> But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. So, I'm worshiping God, but they call me a heretic for doing it this way. You say, what is, what is he doing that they called heresy? Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Why was Paul called a heretic? Because he believed 
every word in the book that he read was true. It was true. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I've got friends who despise me because of my faith in this King James Bible. They say, you know, God, here's one of their favorite arguments. The King James Bible has only been here since 1611. What about all the Christians before then? You know, they didn't have the perfect word of God. And here's my answer to them. Twofold. But one, God gave them exactly what they needed. I guarantee you that. And two, what I am doing is believing every word of scripture. And that's not new. It has been around. Sure. David believed every single word. Paul believed every single word. And today, the people who believe every single word use the King James Bible. That's where you can find them. And not just the ones who use the King James Bible, but the ones who really believe it. They don't try to change it, pervert it, say that it's, you know, an okay translation. No. If you really worship the God that Paul worshipped, then you believe every word in the book that you read. In this book, specifically, not just any old book. And that was Paul's faith. That was his testimony, that he believed all things that were written. And because of that, all the people around him called him a heretic after the way which they call heresy. And I've been called a heretic by many of my friends for having faith that, hey, what do you know? Every word in the word of God is true. You know, how is that some new idea? It's not new, it's old. It's old as time. So, that's some of the verses that God has helped me with out of the book of Acts. I'm going to try to give you an outline. Acts is 28 chapters long, and that's long. And I can't get through all of it tonight. I'm going to give you an outline so you can understand kind of what's going on. And you'll want to get your pen ready because there's going to be a good bit of writing here to cover what goes on in the book of Acts. So, Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, I'm going to keep it really short and concise on each of these. One, Jesus ascends. Now, there's some other things, but that's the main thing that happens in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches at Pentecost. There's a whole sermon. We just looked at a couple verses, but there's a whole sermon that Peter preaches at that feast at the temple in Jerusalem. In chapters, I'm sorry, just chapter 3. In chapter 3, Peter preaches at the temple again. Peter at the temple. And I'll take a quick look at a verse. If you remember in Acts 2.38, he said, Repent and be baptized. That was how he was telling them to have their sins forgiven. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, he's preaching similarly. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Repent and be converted. Not the same gospel you and I have. He was preaching something different to unbelieving Jews who had just killed the Messiah. He had a different crowd that he was preaching to. Chapter 4 and 5. Chapter 4 and 5, it's the apostles preaching. Doing miracles. And imprisoned. In chapters 6 and 7, Stephen preaches and gets stoned to death. Which I can't imagine is the most comfortable way to go. In chapter 8, we have Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip with whoop, 
Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is one of the first Gentiles on record, the very first one who saved the same way you and I are, where he was preached, he had Jesus Christ preach to him, and then he believed, and after he believed and was saved, then he got baptized. Before then, Peter was saying, repent and be baptized in order to get saved. Now, to the Gentiles, Philip preaches a different thing. He preaches, believe, uh, if thou believest with all thine heart, then thou mayest be baptized. But the belief has to come first. That's the transition to you and me, the Gentiles. Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. Those are two fun words to spell. Ethiopian, E-T-H-I-O-P-I-A-N. Ethiopian eunuch is E U N. U-C-H. I hate that word because it, why spell it that way? But, well, I shouldn't say that. That's a good word from the Bible. Eunuch. Learn the spelling. It's a good word. In chapter 9, Saul is saved. And what is, who is Saul? What's his other name? Paul. Good, Paul. Saul is saved in chapter 9. In chapter 10... I know I wanted to combine these a whole lot more, but I couldn't. If there's so much different is happening, I wanted you to be able to go to your outline here and go to these passages if you want to see what they're about. So chapter 10, you've got Peter uh, preaching to the Gentiles. In chapter 11, um, you've got the apostles in Jerusalem. And in chapter 12, you have James killed and... Peter imprisoned. If you were raised in Sunday school, then all of these bring up some cool stories that you remember growing up. Like when Peter was imprisoned, an angel came and opened the bars of the prison for him. And how James was killed with a sword just because a king was, you know, getting his kicks out of it. He liked to kill the Jews, so he, or he liked killing the Christians. So he, you know, killed James and he thought he was going to kill Peter, but God released him out of the prison. Is anybody really behind and need me to take a break? Okay, you can probably catch the notes off your parents. Good deal. Okay, that was chapter 12. So next we've got chapters 13 and 14. 13 and 14 is um, Paul's first missionary journey with Barnabas. So... Um, yeah, I'll say Paul's first journey with Barnabas. Bar Nabas, the son of Nabas, whoever that is. That's something you should know from the Bible. Bar means the son of. Barnabas. Like, God called Peter Simon Bar-Jonah, that's the son of Jonah. Barnabas, and uh, son of Nabas. And who's the guy that they substituted Jesus' life for with Pilate? Barabbas. Son of Rabbas. Bar was very common back then. Okay, that was 13 and 14. In chapter 15, you've got a council at Jerusalem. Very important. <coughs> That's when Paul and Barnabas and all the apostles are together in Jerusalem and they have that final decision. What are we going to do about the Gentiles? An important question. Okay. And then here it's going to speed up a little bit, thankfully. So, 16 through 18. This is going to be Paul's second journey. Is it hot in here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this time, it's not with Barnabas, it's with Silas. 
His other name is Sylvanus. And on this journey, you know, in his first journey, he went and visited a whole lot of cities, and he would go to the synagogue first, and he would preach to the Jews, and then he would establish a church, and then usually he would get persecuted out of that city and move on to the next one. Here in chapter uh, 16 through 18, on his second journey, is when he runs into most of the churches that you and I are familiar with. So this is when he uh, comes to Derby. I'm not going to mention all the cities, but I'll do the important, uh, the ones that really stand out. Derby and Lystra, who knows who he met there? Who did he meet at Derby and Lystra? Somebody who he grabbed and took with him the rest of his ministry. Timothy. Timothy. Timotheus. It's a good name. He met him at Derby and Lystra. Then he went to something that should sound familiar, Galatia. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Galatians. Next, he went to Philippi. Then, Thessalonica. These should be very familiar to you. Then, Berea. Then, Athens. <coughs> I mean, he's traveling to all these places that you should uh, know about. Here in Athens, he does something significant. He has met the Christians at Thessalonica, and while he's in Athens on his second missionary journey, from Athens, he writes 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So, I mean, very shortly after he met them, he found it important to write down some things that they needed to know and send them a letter. And 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were the first epistles that Paul wrote. You can tell that from the timeline of the book of Acts here. Next, I'm going to cut Timothy's head off here. And I'm going to move this, this list of places to over here. Next, he goes to Corinth. What does that remind you of? Corinthians. Corinthians. From Corinth, he writes a book of the Bible. Guess which one? Nope. Well, he's with them. Why does he need to write them a book? He writes Romans. Romans is the third Pauline epistle written. It's written very early. It's written to Gentiles in Rome who had never, ever met Paul. Gentiles in a Gentile country who had never met him. Which is why I believe Romans is just about the most important book of the Bible for you and me. Because we are Gentiles in a Gentile country who have never met Paul. And that's who he was writing to right there. I mean, Romans is just so important for a Christian. Next he goes to a little familiar place called Ephesus. And I misspoke a minute ago. He grabbed Timothy at Derby and Lystra. And then he left him here at Ephesus. Timothy was the first bishop at Ephesus. So... He leaves Timothy there. And after Ephesus, they go back to Antioch, where they were sent from, and they take a break. So that's the second missionary journey, where he meets all of these people that we know about uh, from the other books of the New Testament. That's in 16 through 18. And now, in 19 and 20, he has his third missionary journey. And uh, I don't really know who was with him, but <coughs> somebody was. I know at least Luke was. Luke was with him for that one and later on. During this third journey, uh, while he's in a place called Phrygia, Phrygia, he writes a letter back to Timothy called 1 Timothy. So he's left Timothy behind to pastor a church in Ephesus to be one of the bishops at a church in Ephesus and he writes him that letter of how to be a minister to give him the exhortation that he needs then he's in a region called Macedonia and he writes to a dear friend of his named Titus then he goes back to Philippi and like I said he did a lot more cities in between all these but these are the ones I wanted to highlight and from Philippi he writes 
1st and 2nd Corinthians. This is really cool to me. When studying this a couple years ago, it was really cool to see the timeline of where he was. And that kind of helps. Now when you're reading one of these books, you can go back to this page and see kind of where was Paul in his ministry when he wrote this? What was he going through? You can go to the book of Acts and see, you know, what was he going through in that city while he was in Corinth, you know, being persecuted? How did he have the time to write to the Romans? Just It's cool to know what was going on while he was writing these books that are so important for you and me. The last section... 21 through 28. Things kind of slowed down. Paul is, uh, this will be kind of long, but Paul is captured in Jerusalem. <coughs> and taken to Rome. And as far as we know, Paul is the only apostle who ever went to Rome, not Peter, which means Peter's body shouldn't be there, which means the Catholics are lying when they say they have Peter's body in Rome. So in 21 through 28, he's captured in Jerusalem, and he's taken to Rome. From Rome, he writes Galatians. I'll just abbreviate here. He writes Ephesians. He writes Philippians, he writes Colossians, he writes 2 Timothy, and he writes, the last one we haven't mentioned, what Pauline epistle have we not mentioned? Philemon, Philemon. <coughs> he writes all those from prison in Rome. And uh, he got treated pretty well as a prisoner. He even got to have his own hired house for a couple years there at the end. Any questions at all about what happened here in the book of Acts? So, um, the next lesson, Lord willing, I'm going to do if God allows, all 13 of Paul's epistles in one chunk, because right when we finish the New Testament survey here, or the introduction to the New Testament, we're going to dive into a verse-by-verse -verse teaching through all of Paul's epistles. So I don't want to take too much time right now just to introduce them. We'll go ahead and do that when we get to them, Lord willing, in just you know a month or so. So Paul... My best guess, best guess is a hummingbird. He's a big uh, Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, what, that's about what a locust in Revelation I bet is going to sound like. I mean, goodness gracious. Um, something you should be able to tell just from looking at what happened to Paul throughout the book of Acts is that this man gave his life for this ministry. He was not about himself or about being comfortable or being set up in a good house with a farm and with a wife and kids on a house on a hill. He was dedicated to the ministry and we should be very thankful for the hard work that paul put in uh serving the lord jesus christ any questions at all about acts <clears throat>